Well, hello there. You're watching the press preview. A first look then at what is on the front pages. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the Observer's chief leader writer, Sonia Soda, and the journalist and author, Ella Whelan. Great to see you both. Hello to you. Hi. Hi. So, as ever, let's take a look, shall we, at the front pages. The Metro sums up an emotional day as the COVID-19 vaccine was administered in the UK for the first time. Their headline, cheers and then tears. One down, 54 million to go, declares the Mirror, which pictures the first recipient, 90-year-old Margaret Keenan. Daily Mail hails V-Day heroes who made Britain proud. It also pictures my Sky News colleagues, Beth Rigby and Kay Burley. Amid the happiness on the vaccine, a note of caution from the Telegraph, which says masks may still need to be worn until late next year. The future of Britain's relationship with the EU hangs on the success of a dinner between the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and the European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen. That's the Guardian's take on Brexit. Same lead, as you can see, for the eye, calling it a showdown on the future of the UK. Well, Sonia Soda, Ella Whelan are here. Two big stories. Again, it feels like the theme, does it not? Uh, but let's start with the vaccine, shall we? Uh, onto the Metro, cheers and then tears. And Sonia, it, it really did actually feel like a, an emotional day, didn't it? Yeah, I think for everyone, because we've all been going through this pandemic together. We've all been told uh, that a vaccine you know, there will be one hopefully eventually, but it may take many months. And we sort of finally arrived at the day uh, when the first vaccines were administered here in the UK after they passed all their medical regulations and checks. So it does feel like a real, real moment in this pandemic. Of course, we're not completely out of the woods yet. Um, there's a big logistical exercise in vaccinating the population, starting with those who are considered to be the highest risk first. So we've got to get that right. And we do all have to stick to uh, the restrictions and measures that are in place to keep the virus under control as the vaccination gets rolled out but I mean it's just it's great news really it's it's um it's really really good uh and you know the that newspaper features a picture of Matt Hancock on the front page as well actually getting emotional um and I do think that some of the vaccine nationalism from ministers has been slightly you know distasteful saying well we're the first country to get it out because we're the best country there is uh, I don't I'm not sure that was called for but I do think uh of course it's a big moment for Matt Hancock um and you know I've been very very critical of the health minister during this pandemic i think the government's made some real mistakes but um you know he has been working hard so that's for sure and so um you know of course it, it was going to be a sort of a bit of a moment yes the perils of a live interview i think uh, in some of the comments you were were quoting there uh, the picture we saw obviously margaret keenan um living in coventry her 91st birthday next week and many of the older people who received the vaccine today ella had clearly just not been out. They were looking forward to going around the shops, um, missing people, they were saying. It was extraordinary to hear their stories because in many respects, they've been a number, haven't they? Yeah, it was a really, it's a good reminder of what sacrifice people have made. I mean, it, it wasn't like I'm going to jet off to uh, somewhere hot or I'm going to do anything extravagant. It was sort of anecdotes like, well, I'm going to go you know, walk to the end of the street or I'm going to go get that pint of milk on my own. It was very normal things, which makes you realise how much people's normal lives have been affected. Maybe I'm a cynic, I don't know, but I just did not buy the tears from Matt Hancock on GMB. I think maybe it's because I didn't watch that particular interview, but I did hear him on the radio this morning on Today programme. And while he uh, sounded a bit choked for, for for about 10 seconds about how, you know, how brilliant today's news was, he then went on to say, of course, that this really means that basically nothing changes. I mean, the, the, he, the kind of cautionary um, response that he had after that. He didn't really allow himself to, or us listening, to revel in the potential of this vaccine, which is, you know, on the face of it, it's a scientific breakthrough. It's a fantastic step um, for human invention. But I mean, the crucial thing is that it could spell the end of the misery that we've been living in. And if you look elsewhere in the papers, I mean, we're talk talking about the fact that masks might still be, um, might still be compulsory in certain parts of life, that um, 
Matt Hancock himself saying that nothing really has, you know, should change, that we still should be very cautious. And while obviously there are certain sensible elements to that, because the, one of the things about the vaccine is we don't know whether, what it does to transmission. And so until every single uh, old and vulnerable and, you know, the majority of us get it, we should be being cautious. But it's just that still depressing underlying sense of, no, we can't go back to normal, which I think casts a bit of a shadow over this because while we should be celebrating Margaret Keenan and William Shakespeare who came after her um, <laughs> not the deceased but actually someone from Warwickshire um, there the question is will this actually is this going to be the magic bullet to kill it and to knock off the virus um, it doesn't seem like it that we've got we've got a lot of pessimism still coming from ministers and the chief scientific advisor but not surprisingly if you look at the daily mirror um 800,000 doses this week and yet sonia there are 30 million people on the government's priority list who are deemed to need this virus it is a as you put it herculean task to get through everybody it is it is a big logistical task i don't think it's as challenging i mean i may live to regret my words it doesn't feel as challenging for example as building a track and trace system from scratch because the nhs i mean obviously this is a unique scenario but the nhs is used to uh, delivering mass vaccination every winter season with the flu jab so there are you know, procedures and protocols in place. Obviously, there are particular requirements, like with this vaccine, it needs to be kept at exceedingly cold temperatures uh, until, you know, the sort of couple of days before it's administered. So there are new logistical challenges with this one, but I do think they are lesser uh, than, you know, the challenges in building a, a track and trace system. And I, I've been very critical of this government levels of competence in handling this pandemic. If you look at something like track and trace or getting PPE out to frontline healthcare stuff earlier in the pan pandemic. But I, I do think that, that, that hopefully this will be in hand more and it is a real cause for optimism. And I think, you know, the difference that this makes is, yes, we do have to stick to restrictions for a while longer, but the, the difference here is that there is an end in sight. And I think that does make it easier, particularly if you're talking about, um, you know, all the adjustments that we've made to our lives, um, the fact that the sort of highest priority people will be getting it first, so people in care homes. So we should be able to open up care homes more to relatives. I think that's going to be really vital. And also the fact that, you know, we know it's now just going to be a matter of months before life can on the whole get back to normal fingers crossed, touch wood, um, that means that actually the economic support that businesses need to survive um, should be time limited. And I think that that means that really the Treasury should be looking at make sure that the, making sure the support is really, really generous so we don't see businesses going bust. And uh, Ella, there we are, Daily Telegraph, then the story that you alluded to, masks for a year despite the vaccine. This kind of harks back to the discussion we saw last week between the Jep Deputy Chief Medical Officer Jonathan Van Tam and the Prime Minister, uh, Mr Van Tam suggesting that actually some of the things we've learnt, like hand washing and a bit of social distancing, perhaps should be here to stay, you know, to fight off respiratory and other illnesses. And that is really frightening and depressing and I don't want to sound like a kind of alarmist here but we you know the social distancing is necessary to fight this virus and it should be done in the right place at the right time and you should be wearing masks when you're in enclosed um, spaces all of that seems to me eminently sensible and people are doing it but the idea that this this is the kind of what I was trying to get at in terms of what really changes because what happens when uh, another virus comes along, you know, maybe in a few years time, obviously I would like it to never this to never happen again. I don't want to rerun of a rerun of 2020. But all the um, kind of discussion around the science of this says that the fact that we have these very global lives and that there's lots more of us on the planet, that it's quite likely that we might be seeing more coronaviruses in the future. Are we going to do a rerun of the strategy that we've had this year? And if we're going to have a kind of a intensely risk averse approach to things which on the one hand is obviously you know has its place because you don't want people to die and it's particularly people that are at risk of dying from this virus but 
having a risk averse approach in terms of keeping in place things like social distancing, them being here to stay, them being part of a new normal. It's not normal to uh, social distance from each other. It's really quite alienating going on um, public transport, walking down the street when people are flinching from you. That that kind of disintegration of the, the social fabric that we all love and enjoy, even miserable Londoners uh, <laughs> might not admit it, but the whole kind of not not having to feel like you're going to brush up against someone and infect them is, is really destructive. And I want that to come to an end. The, part of my excitement about the vaccine and us getting over this is that, you know, I don't have to worry about touching a touching a granny or hugging someone or being next to someone because you know that is the normal that we want to get back to and you know the question is is that necessary to keep us safe or are there more important things than being safe and that's a difficult debate to have but i think it's one that once we're over this fingers crossed in the spring when we can have another look at how to deal with getting back to normal those debates have to happen because those underlying trends of, uh, you know, moving forward, saying that we have to always have a kind of safetyist approach is going to have other ramifications in parts of our life that are very important. Yes, and uh, perish the thought that there is another virus, perhaps that the, the vaccine and therapeutic science that we've learned from this could be transposed to that and we don't have to suffer another 2020, as you said. But uh, plenty more still to come, uh, including the other big story in town, Brexit talks going down to the wire, as you know. Uh, Boris Johnson on manoeuvres. Uh, let's discuss that after the break. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview. With me now, Sonia Soda and Ella Whelan. Welcome back to both of you. Um, Ella, uh, to The Guardian now. The Prime Minister dashes to Brussels amid fears the chance of Brexit deal is now very slim. Um, how are you feeling about all of this as a Brexit supporter? Well, it's like a Christmas pantomime, isn't it? It's, instead of, is he behind you? Where is he? Will he? What? It's all will he, won't he? And there's a huge amount of suspense in this. But I think most of us are probably exceedingly bored at this point um, of being expected to get excited when uh, a secret private dinner happens in Brussels between um, our politicians and theirs. And I think for me, the major point out of all of this is that we must remember that this is that Brexit cannot be reduced to tinkering um, between two political powers of how to get out of this, scrape out of this um, with the least amount of damage, which I think is what it's come down to. And instead, remember that the vote for to leave the European Union was about something much bigger and much more important in terms of a question of sovereignty and democracy. Uh, and so I think that Brexiteers will be watching this knowing that uh, if there's a, a sellout deal, that that's an issue. And that if there's a no deal, that we're going to have more of the same uh, panic from certain sections of the British political establishment about the consequence of Brexit. But the fact remains that well over four years, uh, was it? Yeah, four years ago, long time, uh, we answered a question and that question and our answer has not yet been implemented. So with bated breath or in boredom, we wait to see the health of democracy in the UK. Uh, we've only got one minute left. Sonia, do you want to talk about that? Because I know you uh, disagree on many points. Or do you want to do our final story, which is the, uh, the, the royal tour? Well, I'll just say, first of all, on Brexit, I think it's really important that there is a lot at stake here. But even if we get the best sort of available outcome to us at this stage, which is a, a, a bare bones free trade deal, the OBR, the independent OBR, has forecast that the impact of this is going to be really, really significant on GDP in the medium term, bigger than the coronavirus pandemic. That's a lot of jobs that are going to be lost as a result. So it's high stakes, but even the best outcome for, for us at this stage is going to mean people losing their jobs and their livelihoods, which I think is a huge regret. Um, have I got time for the last story? You do but let's quick? just let's show it anyway. I'm afraid we can't discuss it, but we will at half 11. Uh, sorry, there's no welcome in the hillside, Kate. Uh, this is Wales, they say, echoing Scotland's views on the Royals train tour. We can talk about that half past 11. We will see you then. Thank you both very much indeed for now. Uh, let's check out the weather briefly. <laughs>